Executive Director for the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I want to thank you for coming to this month's installment of our Artist, Scholars, and Innovators Lecture Series, where we um, recognize and showcase award-winning faculty members. Each year, Marshall recognizes excellence in our faculty with a series of awards. Our pre presenters today were the 2020 recipients of the Distinguished Artist Scholars Award for the Team Award. The work of the team focuses on the movable project, Narratives of Recovery in Place. And I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Kristen Lilvis, who is the um, PI on this project and let um, Kristen introduce her co-PIs. Sure. Um, thanks everybody for being here. So I'm Dr. Kristen Lilvis. I am the Director of Digital Humanities and I'm a professor in the English department. And joining me today are Dr. Stefan Schuberlein uh, and Dr. Hilton Cordoba. And we're gonna just give a little bit about Movable. Um, but first, let me go ahead and share my screen. And can everybody see that? Okay, good, thanks. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. I'm excited to see a couple students here. So thank you, uh, Jess and Eric. Um, and thank you, Jenny and Karen, for making this presentation possible, and to Marshall and the CTL for awarding us the Distinguished Artists and Scholars Team Award and for supporting Movable Broadly. We really appreciate everything that everybody has done. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, Movable Narratives of Recovery in Place is an interactive GIS-enabled community website that collects and archives written and visual narratives, as well as oral histories of recovery in Appalachia and beyond. Movable works to shift the conversation on substance use disorder in our region from statistics on incarcerations, overdoses, and deaths to human stories of struggle, community, and hope. And to help you get a little bit better acquainted, we have a short video that some of our student content creators have produced, and we'd like to play that for you. Recovery is a process that looks different for everyone. At Movable, we highlight each person's unique story. Our website gives people a platform to share what recovery means to them. We provide the tools that make it easy for folks to share their stories. Our interactive map connects people to places where stories have been shared throughout Appalachia and across the country. By definition, movable means capable of being moved. Recovery is possible, and we are moving beyond stigma. These are our stories. We are movable. So, um, this is maybe a little non-traditional, but we're going to ask people to go ahead and uh, take a look at the website while we're talking today. So we're at movableproject.org, M-O-V-A-B-L-E project.org. And the site's mobile friendly, so basically we're saying go ahead and play on your phones uh, while we're chatting a little bit about our beginnings, our current undertakings, some of our scholarly rationale, and our future plans. So when you get to the site, what we hope uh, you'll discover are some of the 60 plus stories that we have there. And we use the word stories when we're talking about what's archived on the site, um, but really the term is too narrow. We have nonfiction narratives, poems, video and audio interviews, photography and collages, and we even have a musical composition that's inspired by recovery. And most of the stories come from individuals in recovery from substance use disorder, but we also have stories focused on alcohol use disorder, as well as stories from individuals who've been affected by a loved one's SUD or AUD. And while storytellers can submit text, images, audio, and video through the website, most of the content has come through one-on-one -on -one interviews that we've done with individuals in recovery, as well as group workshops that have been run by faculty, students, and regional recovery organization leaders. So once a story is submitted to the site, our student research assistants make sure that it can be identified by the contributor's name or pseudonym, uh, the geographic coordinates, and thematic and genre-based tags, which allow visitors to the site to find recovery stories by looking for people they know, places they're familiar to them with or concepts that they're interested in. So for instance, um, here we can see 
part of what it looks like on the site if you go to a story. This is a story um, by Mitzi Averett. And you could discover this story by searching for her name on the site, by looking near Fayetteville, West Virginia on the map, or selecting tags, family, faith, healthcare, job, or prose. And what I want to touch on here is the site's navigability. Uh, visitors have multiple paths to find stories and the site will direct them to other stories in that geographic area or other stories with the same tags. And visitors can also engage with the stories um, and you can see there we have like a like option that lets people pick from some pre-selected um, ways to interact with the story. So clicking something like this inspires me. Um, the site didn't always look like this though. So ideas for movable began in 2016 when I worked with Kristen Steele, who's a former English faculty member, and then also Amy Saunders, who's the managing director of the Center of Recover Excellence for Center of Excellence for Recovery at Marshall. And we worked on Addiction in Appalachia, which was a performance-based event for people who wanted to talk about um, substance use disorder, either as affecting them or their loved ones. And then after that event, Chris and I worked with Lynn O'Connell on an, an endeavor to train local reporters about using non-stigmatizing language and images in their stories. And so these two projects, helping individuals affected by SUD share their stories, and then also aiding local media in more responsibly reporting on SUD, really highlighted a need for individuals to be able to tell their own stories in the way that they want and being able to access them um, in ways that are convenient to them. So that's when Movable was born, and this is our um, early prototype. So thanks to a $5,000 grant from the West Virginia Humanities Council, Hilton and Stefan came on board along with a web designer from Marshall IT. And we created this Google Maps based prototype. And you can see with the black arrows, there's little um, blue triangles that people could click on to see stories at this time. Um, so the, today the site has a more usable interface and a clearer purpose thanks to feedback from focus groups, research by faculty and student assistants, and funding from outside sources. Um, but it was really this, this early site that got us to where we're going. And so here you can see what we've ended up changing to. So that recovery stories, rather than just the map itself, that field of green and gray, uh, is now central. Visitors are greeted, whether on the home page or through the map interface, with quotes from contributors that highlight important elements in their recovery. And we hope that you'll read through some of these stories, especially if you're new to the site, but we do regularly update. So even if you've checked it out before, um, you can see highlighted content and new content on that home page. And then there's also always new stories that you can view through the map or through the stories button. Um, so how did we get here from that original prototype? Uh, we've attracted over $200,000 in grant funding primarily through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration State Opioid Response Grant. And these funds have gone towards site development, including partnering with Error Agency, a web development company based in the UK, and toward employing and collaborating with over 20, 20 community members, students, and faculty to collect texts and conduct research on stigma related to substance abuse, misuse. Um, movable editors and research assistants have held participatory mapping sessions, which Hilton will talk a little bit more about, and storytelling workshops, which Stefan I know is going to touch on, in locations from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Morgantown, West Virginia, creating a community produced site, as well as novel research opportunities in critical cartographies and document analysis. And so when I say that movable is community produced, what I think is really important is that the work that we do is with the community to discover the best strategies to ethically collect and share stories. So one, we pay our employees, which includes our community partners, university staff, and faculty and students in English, geography, journalism, classics, psychology, linguistic anthropology, video production, addiction studies, and digital humanities. Um, we employ individuals who are in recovery as, though, as well as those who have loved ones um, who have AUD or SUD and also students who are studying addiction. And then when engaging with the public, we similarly keep ethics and social justice in mind, putting our funding toward efforts that make the site accessible to everybody. So the site, as I mentioned, um, 
is really friendly on cell phones. We designed it to be mobile first so that individuals with low bandwidth and those who surf the internet primarily through their phones can access and submit stories. And then we also work to make sure that everything we do um, when possible, we like to have in-person opportunities, but especially since COVID, we want to make things virtual so that people have opportunities to participate no, what, no matter where they're located. So we've collected stories at local recovery events, run writing workshops at community centers and libraries, and also done phone and video, video interviews on demand. And we work with community members to determine the structure of these collaborations so that Movable is a project done with and by those in recovery rather than just for them. So I think that's something that's really important is that putting the power and the tools in the hands of the people who are in recovery. So this is, has led to a couple of different things for the site. So one, um, community members made clear during one early workshop that they wanted to work on art instead of writing. So we've since gone into in-person workshops prepared with a variety of prompts and project ideas. And then similarly, the feedback options that I mentioned earlier that people can leave on the site, those developed after consultation with recovery leaders who made clear that traditional open-ended comments weren't always useful and could be harmful to those in recovery. So to, together we created these new options for engagement. And we also allow people to click multiple options on the site, which is innovating off of like traditional social media when you get one emoji um, for a a person or for a post. Um, in addition to talking with individuals in the recovery community about site development, we really have partnered with local organizations to collect stories and promote related social justice projects. So some of our past partners um, and present partners include Marshall University, Harmony House, WVU, Cowell County Library, Recovery Point, the Southern West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network, and the University of Minnesota. And we have an ongoing collaboration with the Great Rivers Regional System for Addiction Care, which has organized their own video storytelling series and allows us to archive their stories on our site. And then we also transcribe all of their stories to make sure everything is accessible, um, no matter how people might want to access what is on the site. Um, and we've also had movable stories be featured at events such as All Walks of Recovery, Recovery for a Change. Really recently, the Meigs County Recovery Walk had QR codes that people could scan and then read stories from movable. And then also at National Collegiate Recovery Day, we did some presentations. So we are out there in the public um, collecting stories and sharing the stories that we have. But what is I think especially important right now is that we are also always available online and we have that new content being added regularly. So that is where people can find us at any moment that is convenient to them. So next I'm gonna turn things over to Hilton and I know he's gonna talk a little bit more about how we got where we are in terms of mapping and what we're doing right now. Hilton, are you ready? Yes, I'm switching over here to my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, so as Kristen was describing, I'm Hilton Cordova. I'm from the geography department and I know you're probably wondering how a geographer got together with two oh. English people and kind of uh, convinced them to add a map. <laughs> because uh, as you saw, um, Mapping is a key component to uh, the movable project, uh, specifically to help tell the story of people in recovery. And you're probably wondering, well, why a map and how can a map really help tell the story of people in recovery? And the answer to that question really is because of the uh, power of maps, right? Maps are very powerful tools, particularly uh, uh, from a visual perspective. And so it is important that for us, um, particularly you know, after seeing what was happening with the uh, cartographic products that were being put out uh, to the public uh, in regards to the opioid crisis, that we kind of, um, we wanted to really leverage the same power of maps, but uh, in a way that really benefited uh, and specifically kind of um, cast it light on the other side of the crisis, which was, you know, the stories of recovery. So uh, in terms of power of maps, um, it is important, as I said, to have the right um, relationship, uh, specifically when it comes to who's doing the mapping and what's being mapped. Um, 
you know, in terms of who is doing the mapping, as I said, most of the time uh, when it comes to the opioid crisis, it has been um, either law enforcement or public health agencies. Uh, and those tend to, again, uh, focus on more the, what more commonly known as death metrics. Um, and specifically because, again, they're coming from state agencies, we rarely do we stop to think about, you know, the legitimacy of these maps or, you know, what potential flaws might be in them or what's being left out. And again, that, you know, we run the risk really on kind of changing the perception of places, right? If we don't stop to think about the whole process. And again, to the point that we can create uh, stigmas in, in certain communities. So again, uh, that's, you know, exactly what has happened with the opioid crisis, uh, very um, top bottom driven. Um, and so some of the metrics and some of the cartographic products that have been put out there tend to really use a lot of these metrics and kind of um, not focus on the recovery side, right? So it's been more like what I call supply side and not so much on the recovery end. And just to give you some examples of some of those platforms and really cartographic products that I was describing, here's one from the um, West Virginia Controlled Substance Monitoring Program. And this is a dashboard that really allows users to map individual substances that are prescribed on a county by county basis. And you can do this from you know, 2014 to 2019. And if you're a data person, of course you love this, right? To be able to kind of manipulate data and visualize it uh, and kind of detect patterns um, so that you can have a, you know, perhaps a better understanding of some of the underlying processes. Uh, but again, that, during that process, that means that there will be a community, right? Where there'll be some sort of hotspot or some sort of low point. And, and so, you know, as a data person, you might think, oh, great, you know, that I'm learning something. Uh, but again, usually that's making a community uh, not look so good, right? Um, here's another example of another of those platforms. This is uh, Naloxone given to uh, EMF to people, of course, um, whenever there's an EMS call. And you can map this data again on a county by county basis, either before or after the arrival of EMS. You can parse this data, whether you know you want to look at it based on age cohorts, or whether you want to look at it based on the day of the week, uh, the gender, and of course, based on the outcome after treatment. And I will throw myself also in this list, right? I've kind of also inadvertently contrib contributed right to this. And that is that, you know, these maps I made uh, for the Center of Excellence and Recovery. Uh, and, you know, the center has, was tasked uh, to really um, monitor, you know, some of these um, uh, programs that have been put up uh, by the state um, that have been doing work to, of course, reduce, uh, you know, um, prescription uh, of opioid in the state. Uh, and, and so, I've been kind of, of course, helping on that end. Um, and of course, what's used are those typical metrics, right? Prescription um, based on a, a, in the population or, you know, a, again, similar metrics. And so again, from a data perspective, this is very interesting, but as you can see, right, uh, you have always these kind of hotspots that, you know, always kind of cast um, a, a bad image on, on certain communities. So, here we have um, then, you know, kind of our rationale in terms of how we wanted to really leverage our uh, maps, but uh, in the right way, right? And, and, and having the right um, balance and the relationship, as I was saying, between who's doing the mapping versus uh, what's being mapped. And so if we wanted to do it the right way, we needed to kind of adopt a new paradigm on one that was rooted in critical cartography. And, of course, critical cartography, all it is, is basically critical theory it just applies to, to mapping or cartography. And what it focuses on is really on more the process of mapping so much and not on the actual uh, final product, right, the map itself. And so what us at Movable always set out to do, and I know Kristen was talking about this, it was critical for us then to, you know, in order to achieve this balance to you know, invite new actors, right? To solicit input from the public, specifically from people who are in recovery, their allies and people in the, in the recovery centers and, and the community as a whole. 
uh, so that we will be able to flip the relationship, right? Instead of being top down, we'll be bottoms up. And instead of using, you know, those metrics, you know, which in many ways can almost be seen as kind of like surveillance metric, right, uh, on the overall population, we'll actually be able to capture other information that those metrics were not sensing, or that we're not, we're not, cap we're not being captured. Uh, but also, of course, to use maps um, in a new way, uh, specifically to um, bring more visibility to the stories of recovery. Now, uh, critical cartography, um, as I said, just like this theory, it's been, it's been um, with us for quite some time, specifically in cartography for about two decades, uh, really since the rise of, of digital mapping, uh, which kind of took off in the, in the late 90s. Um, and, you know, most of its applications are in the area of um, humanitarian projects, like every time you have, for example, um, some sort of natural disaster, you usually see some sort of, um, some of these, uh, platforms come up in terms of um, soliciting public input. Uh, you also see, for example, during um, um, political unrest uh, in terms as a form of um, activism, uh, or sometimes you just see in the form of advocacy, right, which is kind of what us here at Movable are, are trying to do. Uh, and just to give you uh, an example of something, you know, not related to Movable, but I think kind of showcases how uh, this theory can be applied um, for different purposes, but again, one uh, always focus on trying to achieve the right balance uh, and soliciting uh, public input. Here's the community of Kibera, which is really a slum on the outskirts of the city of Nairobi in Kenya. And this was a community that uh, was on the edge of being demolished, uh, in part because of how it was settled, right, through squatting. And therefore, the city officials did not see it as legitimate, right, because of how it was settled. Uh, and so it, it's, it's also so it as a nuisance because of how overcrowded it had become and because of all the public health issues associated with it and also because of some of the crime uh, that, had, uh, that had appeared. And therefore, uh, they felt that because they were not a legitimate community uh, and because they were not mapped, right, if you saw some of the maps from the city, you know, all you saw was a, a little dot with the name Kibera, but you did not see the extent. Therefore, it was easy, easy, very easy for city officials to basically kind of just ignore it and just say, we're going to demolish it and that's it. Well, city residents kind of banded together with the help of, of NGOs to kind of map their community and really kind of push back on that narrative, right? And say like, hey, we're going to show you that we are more than kind of what you're portraying out in the media and you're putting out uh, to the public. And so they went ahead and mapped, you know, all the families and more importantly, they kind of mapped basically all the amenities that they had, the schools, the supermarkets, the clinic, you know, and the point for the points of access for portable water. And what that really showed was, of course, kind of was evidence that, hey, we are really, you know, a functioning part of your city. Yes, you know, we perhaps did not settle this in the most appropriate way, but uh, we really should be incorporated into the city. Uh, and we should, you know, actually receive funding so that we can, you know, really become, um, um, more formal and really have better structures. So they were really actually successful in kind of pushing back on the narrative and actually forcing the city to acknowledge them and, and make it part of the city. So along, you know, hopefully you see the same parallels that we're trying to follow here. And that's basically what we're hoping to do um, in terms of uh, recovery stories, right? Again, counter mapping, shifting that narrative uh, by allowing participants and the recovery community to become the actual creators of knowledge, right? They know best, they, they know what recovery is like. Um, so we want their input and we want them to drive the narrative instead of kind of those metrics from the state to drive the narrative, right? So not top down, but bottoms up. And by doing that, then uh, we are able to accomplish many things, right? First and foremost, we are mapping basically what was being left out, right? The unmapped the stories of recovery, which in many ways, of course, is the other side of the coin of the opioid crisis, right? And it's not just about the downhill prescriptions, you know, fatality. No, there's also, you know, uh, an upswing to this. And so the, uh, this upswing was being left out. So recognizing recovery, uh, um, depicting those recovery stories, right? Really kind of getting a closer look of what is recovery like, you know, 
recovery is not linear, it's more like zigzag. And so, you know, this helps us uh, educate the public on kind of what is our process like. And more importantly, to provide a space for the stories in that community to exist um, so that they're able to um, kind of tell their stories. So as Kristen was describing, when, we, uh, when the movable team uh, goes out into the community uh, and through its partners, uh, the participants in, in these workshops or these interviews, they are provided different um, forms of communicating and expressing themselves. Some, as you can see here, are more creative, uh, more artistic, I guess, um, in terms of uh, collages. Some write poetry, some, you know, write uh, songs, some, you know, uh, do paintings. Some, as you can see, you know, work on maps and kind of use those maps to talk about the meaning of place and specifically talking about how certain places played a role in the, in the recovery process, or perhaps on the other hand, how a place kind of um, made it difficult for them to really um, you know, move on and actually enter recovery. Uh, some, as you can see, uh, do, I guess, what you would consider your more traditional um, handwriting, you know, uh, pen and paper. Uh, some do um, video, com uh, video interviews uh, or, or voice interviews. Um, and so, you know, there are different ways uh, for participants really to express themselves. And once we have all this data, which again, there are the ones creating all this information, um, we not only archive it in our platform, but we then of course uh, map it. Um, and so we try to, again, uh, increase the visibility by mapping uh, these stories uh, uh, in our platform. And so you can see here at the top, our geographic distribution. We're obviously more, uh, most of our stories are uh, in Appalachia, of course, that's our main focus, but we really have gotten stories submitted from as far west as in Arizona, from uh, as far north as, as Minnesota, um, as far south as in Texas. And one of the things that we, uh, you know, we managed to do with this mapping platform is that we managed to protect the privacy of participants so, of course, we did not want, um, you know, users on the side to be able to, uh, you know, um, pinpoint the exact location of, uh, of, of people in recovery, right? We did not want them to know, like, oh, here's someone in recovery lives in this household, uh, you know, in part because of privacy issue. But also, we did not want to really continue to perpetuate, right, that, that stigma that those traditional maps were already uh, doing. Um, and so the last thing we wanted to do was to kind of showcase a section of the city. Oh, look, there's a lot of dots there. So this whole section of the city is just full of people in recovery, right? Uh, and probably people will not even use those terms. Um, and so I really wanted to uh, protect, you know, the, the recovery community. Uh, and so this is why, for example, if you zoom in in a particular area, you're gonna get this loop uh, that you see here where once you reach that level, basically the dots disappear and you basically get a summary of, okay, here's the amount of statistics, uh, excuse me, the amount of uh, stories that we have. And those stories are presented to you on the left panel. Uh, so for us here in the overall Huntington area, there are about 13 stories. And you can then actually click on the stories themselves and you can read them or you can watch the interview or you can see the, you know, the, uh, the piece of art they created and kind of get to know that story at a, at a much more intimate, intimate level, but also know that, hey, you know, there are a lot of these stories uh, in this area here. So this is kind of how we have been able to leverage the power of maps, uh, again, to really recognize and empower the recovery community and really um, shed light on, on their stories. Thank you. And I'll bring it over now to Stefan. All right, thank you so much, Hilton. Can you see my screen? Wonderful, okay. So I'll take it from here and I'll talk a little bit about future directions for Movable, both where we hope to go and also how far we've already gone. And I'll do that by looking at sort of three domains that we feel like Movable sort of sits in the middle of, right? Pedagogy, advocacy, and scholarship. Obviously all of this overlaps and feeds into each other, but that's sort of how I'm gonna structure it for this part of the presentation. Um, obviously for now, 
we've mostly focused on advocacy. And that absolutely makes sense because this is what we see as sort of the heart of Movable at this moment. We want Movable to be a platform where um, people affected by substance use disorder can share a story of recovery, um, where self-advocacy can take place, and where interested folks can read about recovery. So we've purposefully, as Kristen uh, laid it out, designed the site to be engaging, user-friendly, accessible, and to a degree uplifting. So that's really been our core mission. And obviously that's something that we will be focusing on further. And this um, means for us in particular, collecting more stories. Um, you've heard we have 60 stories on there. That's wonderful, but obviously we want to increase that by quite a bit. And um, Chris mentioned, we've had virtual events. We've had outreach events. Um, we've had some people submit through the site, which is always exciting, it means that people are frequenting the site. And that's all great, but our most successful tool has really been the writing workshops that Kristen mentioned. So before Corona hit, we thought about sort of how great that is as a tool and how strongly we believe that this is really a core part of Movable, but how tricky it's gonna to be to upscale that. Um, Kristen has a great car, <laughs> but we can't have her like drive with other team members all over the country to collect more and more stories. That's a sort of natural limit. So if we not wanna only want to increase the count of stories, but also the geographical reach, um, we would have to do something with the workshop format. And right now uh, we have a lot of like really interesting stuff there. We have prompts, a whole set of prompts, detailed instructions. Uh, Hilton has been translating those into Spanish. So we have wonderful resources. We have um, specific instructions. Um, we have crafting materials. The problem is this is what the workshop toolkit looks like right now. It's a really organized, well put together trolley in uh, one of our offices, right? And that, that, that sort of underlines that there's a limitation to that. So what we decided is to transition from this very analog format into something that seems more appropriate for sort of a digital humanities team and create a digital toolkit. So the idea is we'll take all of the uh, um, instructions and all of the materials that we have and uh, transition into an online format, probably a set of PDFs that folks can download. So the idea is instead of every single workshop being run by us, a small recovery group, let's say in North Carolina, who wanted to run a creative writing workshop because I think it's a neat idea, but didn't really have maybe the personnel or the tools to do it, could then download a tool like the Movable Toolkit and just apply it, right? The idea is that it comes with instructions, right? It tells you for the first three minutes, do that. For the next five minutes, do that. Here are a couple of writing prompts, select some, right? Um, so it provides structure and materials for folks who want to perform a movable style workshop, but that can't like get us there to do it in person. And the idea to is to have that freely available CC by so people can uh, um, augment it and change it for however they need it. Um, so this is how we think we can take this workshop format, still sort of under the movable brand and let other people use it. And we really felt like this is a great outreach tool for us because um, right, we would ultimately hopefully be getting more stories, but it's also great for people who wanna run writing workshops, right? We do think it's an important incentive to tell folks your story is important. And we really appreciate that you shared here. If you want to share it even further, you can upload it here and you will be a published author, right? You will can take charge of your story and you can share it with others that might benefit from it, right? So this is our plan. Um, obviously our, pro sorry about that. Obviously our problem is that right now nobody's doing writing workshops, right? You can do a virtual format of that, but ideally when we have this toolkit completed, and I would say we're maybe 60% there, the next step would be assessing its effectiveness, right? Running a couple of times a workshop as if we were to use the movable workshop toolkit digitally, right? And then seeing how it works and then adjusting. And then once it's done publishing, obviously that's something we can't really do right now in a way that's authentic. Um, we sort of envisioning it in terms of, uh, as a model for this, we're sort of envisioning like a psychological test battery Obviously that's not what we're doing here, right? But that's just sort of kind of standardization rigor that we're ultimately striving for with this year, right? Um, and obviously that's something we paused right now, um, but this will be um, where we'll focus most of our energy in the future. Right now we've sort of retransitioned all of our staff to work through our 
fairly sizable backlog to get more and more uh, stories on the site instead. So we're still working on that, but obviously everybody had to adjust and we did as well. So we talked a little bit about advocacy and that's again, the obvious topic. One topic that we didn't really think it through all that much in the beginning is that we're slowly becoming sort of a pedagogical tool as well. Um, we always knew we want to have students and uh, uh, on staff and went to work with students and maybe have some interns, right? But we never really considered Marshall um, movable. We always considered Marshall to be an educational institution, but we never considered movable to sort of be a primary educational tool for certain elements. Um, and for this semester, certainly, but also for the last semester, we've really pushed um, towards sort of professionalizing internally to have like a really clear pedagogical outlook. Um, this meant, for instance, um, having a clear internal workflow and clear sort of positions that come with skills that students fill. We now have senior RAs and um, entry level RAs. They will learn different things. We will take them to uh, workshops to, for instance, learn a recovery friendly language. We've done things like that in the past, right? And they have very clear expectations for what they're doing, how they're doing it. We've developed editorial policy documents, um, transcription guidelines. Uh, ultimately, we will publish those as well, right? With the idea that students know what specific skills they can acquire here. There's a guiding structure that lets them acquire it. And with a fairly sizable staff that we have right now, this has worked really well for us. Um, we've had positive feedback, especially from our graduate RAs. So this is sort of our internal professionalization when it comes to educating students um, and educating ourselves, certainly. Um, the next step is that we sort of reconsidered our place in Marshall, right? We're already a very interdisciplinary team and we're already using Marshall in our teaching. I teach Intro to Digital Humanities. Movable is a big part of that when we talk about archiving. I know Kristen uses um, Movable in her classes and we have some of her students here. <laughs> Hi again. Um, we've been to the geography department and talked at the, the, the GIS day. So we already were a sort of interdisciplinary program, but now we've branched out when it comes to student education. We've worked with uh, Karen McComas, uh, hi Karen, at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we worked with a colleague uh, in media and digital arts, and we even have like a mini collaboration with somebody from music, uh, from the music department that I'll briefly sample in a second, and that Kristen already previewed a little bit earlier. So I'm just going to walk through some of those really quickly just to sort of see the different pathways that we're thinking about in terms of getting students involved. And one that Karen really pushed and that we're really happy to be a part of is um, uh, getting undergrads to engage in research. So right now on our staff, we have two paid undergrad interns that are not only working for us, but they're also going through a class load that comes with a research project. Um, last semester, was it last semester? Yes, time changes weirdly. Last semester, they all had a class that we co-taught where we talked about the basics of scientific research, uh, quantitative versus qualitative, that kind of thing. Then students split up, where began to associate with different projects and started developing their own research program. The two students are currently writing an IRB which is great, right? And ultimately, hopefully next semester, they will try it out. They will run the study and it'll benefit us, but it also certainly will benefit them. And um, it's always exciting. And it's especially exciting for us to have students participate like in authentic, real research in a humanities field. Um, that's still pretty rare. And we're sort of glad to be a part of that. So that's been a huge part of this semester and last semester and semesters going forward. There's obviously some issues and some streamlining that needs to happen, but we're really glad to be a part of that. And it's not something that we have expected initially when we conceptualized movable, but now it's here and it's great. Um, we've collaborated with uh, Tija Baumgartner in, uh, um, in video for her video production class. Um, if you go on our website, you can find a lot of all of the people that I mentioned here, the undergrads I previously mentioned, and the people from this class that are working on it on our team page with photos. But the idea here is, right, this is a class that we're students learn how to produce video, right? So we collaborated with a professor to have them produce videos for us, right? So it's an authentic learning experience. They're creating something that we actually need and it's gonna get published. They're gonna get credit. They're on the website, they're part of the team. You've seen the little intro video that was made by them and it looked really cool. And if you don't look at it through Zoom, it doesn't even stutter. <laughs> so it's, we're really happy about that. So they've become an integral part of the project in a way that we didn't anticipate. But now it's really cool. Do you want to upload the video to our site? Here's a cool snappy little video that walks you through how to do that. 
So that's been invaluable. And we learned a lot, we benefited a lot, but I certainly hope they also learned quite a bit, right? There's always a difference if you have to do like a homework assignment that you do for your professor and something that will actually be on the internet that will be a professional important uh, kind of publication. So we've been really excited to have them on board. Um, and the other collaboration that I briefly teased is a former master's student, now an adjunct faculty, Jonathan uh, Schoff in the music department. He contacted us at a certain point and said, I, I sort of, I make my own sort of artistic uh, jam sessions with other artworks, right? I made a song about this recovery story. Do you want to have it on your website? So uh, we contacted the person that he sort of created this uh, musical piece in response to, and that person said, great. Absolutely, go for it. So now we have it on the website. Right, smooth, jazzy, sort of electronic music. Awesome, right? We didn't anticipate that, came out of the blue. A student brought it up to us, right? And we turned that into a call. Not a lot of takers yet, right? But if you wanna do something like this, we're open to it, right? There are all of these things that are sort of organically rising up out of our martial art ecosphere that we didn't anticipate, but that are suddenly like reshaping the ways we think about the site in quite fundamental ways. So that's been really fun. So if anything like this comes to mind for you, get in contact with us. That's sort of one of the big messages here. If you want to do anything, if you have students that might want to do something here, if you have an internship program, if you want to collaborate on a project, get in contact with us. That's, we, we're really enjoying these parts, uh, right? So we talked a little bit about advocacy, pedagogy, and now I'll go into scholarship. And obviously, right, you'll notice that everything I've talked about so far is basically also scholarship, right? But what I mean by this is in particular, um, oops, in particular, what this means here is how can we make this sort of recovery-centric advocacy side be relevant to a wider field of researchers, either working on recovery or substance use disorder, or folks from the wider digital humanities, folks who are just interested in the effects of storytelling, these kind of things. Um, right now, again, that's not our main focus, but ultimately we do want to transition into that as well. So we've begun to implement certain things. If you search for stories, there's now a little tiny piece of writing, show advanced filters. It's easy to overlook, and right now you're supposed to overlook it. Because um, what it does, it basically allows you to filter stories for demographic info. And that's something we started a little bit later, so we don't have it for a lot of stories yet. So that's why we're de-emphasizing it. But what you can see here, right, we're asking for, in, uh, in future contributors, we'll ask them for age, gender, race, faith, and level of education. Because that's sort of the research that we immediately thought might be relevant, right? We can imagine somebody who says, I'm really interested in how, I don't know, um, queer black men from Appalachia um, discuss recovery. I'm interested in what role faith plays in recovery, right? Gender differences, age differences, right? How does somebody uh, in the 70s narrate recovery and how is it different from somebody in the 20s? So that's a potential scholarly use that we immediately um, thought of. And that's what it would look like on the site, the filter, or what it does look like right now. So we have the structure in place and we're beginning to sort of roll this out and ask um, contributors to volunteers information. Obviously they don't have to, it's all voluntary, right? But it would allow for another kind of scholarly engagement with this. This is probably not something that a general user might be immediately interested, in, but again, scholars might be, right? And ultimately that's sort of the kind of transition that we see as the next major phase of site development to transition from being just this accessible sort of end user focused, general user focused site to something that maybe has a separate section specifically for scholars. And we're really thinking this can be powerful when it's coupled with a batch download option. Right now, we already have a download option. We can download our whole corpus and run, I don't know, linguistic analysis on it, right? If you want to have a corpus of contemporary Appalachian uh, writing, informal writing, this is, we have this corpus. If you need it for your linguistic assignment, you can have it. It's free. It's here. Download it, right? So we're already trying to be welcoming, but we think coupled with this filter option, that'll generate really, really interesting potential statistical analysis, linguistic analysis, all of that kind of stuff. And obviously, that's just one pathway that we sort of imagine might be helpful. You might have others, right? So we probably won't make any major changes to any of this in the next coming semester or two. But ultimately, in the next major site revamp, we want to have more um, specifically academic and scholarly focused 
aspects and functionalities to our site. So if you think of a cool idea for like, I don't know, a life data visualization on the site, run it by us. We're, we're always happy to have feedback like that. That helps us grow the site and make it become an even more versatile, uh, applicable sort of scholarly, but also advocacy focused tool. Right. So that being said, that's sort of the three domains we can need. We need your help with all of them. So get in contact with us. Um, if you see us in person, you can contact our individual email addresses. Here's our website. Here's our team, uh, Gmail, one Twitter, follow us on Twitter, one Facebook, like us on Facebook, and let's start a conversation, right? So we would really want to hear from you. What are your impressions? What are your worries? Um, what do you want to do with Movable? 